Why are Adams Catholic? Adams? A T O M S atoms. Why are atoms Catholic? Because he had mass. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> A photon walks into a hotel. The desk clerk says, Welcome to our hotel. Can we help you with your luggage? The photon says, No thanks, I'm traveling light. Uh, yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Diane's like, What? <laughs> Big photons you, you, you'll involve get it later. light. Oh, you're he's traveling light. Three or, oh. four, three or four o'clock this afternoon. He is <laughs> traveling light. <laughs> Traveling light. Light. Okay. Light. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse one, verses 1 through 3 first in the Passion Translation. And uh, it says, For every high priest was chosen... <laughs> wow, gee. <laughs> Here, let me take that for you. <laughs> okay, back to the scriptures. For every high priest was chosen from among the people and appointed to represent them before God by presenting their gifts to God and offering sacrifices on their behalf. Since high priest is also one who is clothed in weakness, he humbles himself by showing compassion to those who are ignorant of God's ways and stray from them. And for this reason, he has to not only present the sin offering, offerings of others, but also to bring a sin, sin offering for himself. And no one... Oh, we'll stop there. Okay. So, Paul, like, you know, when they wrote the letters back then, they didn't have verse numbers, they didn't have chapter numbers, they didn't have titles of the chapters. They were continuing their thought from the previous thought. So it's important to connect that because I like the verse, you know, verse numbers, and I like the section numbers, but I think sometimes they put the section numbers in the wrong places. Uh, one example is uh, Romans chapter 7 into uh, chapter 8. I feel like they should have put that verse 1 right there with chapter 7, and because it divides up the thought of Paul describing his pre-Christ life versus his now Christ life. And so that's a little frustrating. So here, we ended chapter 4, just to refresh, because we were, you know, out of t I was out of town last week, is where he was talking in verse 14, so then we must cling in faith to all we know to be true, for we have a magnificent king priest, Jesus Christ, Son of God, who rose into the heavenly realm for us, and now sympathizes with us in our frailty. So if you look at this one, it's talking about how the earthly high priest was also supposed to sympathize with those that he served, and that was as he carried in the sacrifice on behalf of the people, it also had to include him. Yet Jesus is different in that he was without sin. But it's comparing the, the sympathy, the compassion the high priest was supposed to have then it says he understands humanity. Jesus understands humanity. For as a man, our magnificent high priest was tempted in every way just as we are and conquered sin. So now we come freely and boldly to where love is enthroned to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. So this is a comparison where the earthly high priest was a, a person of sin and had to have a sacrifice on his behalf as well. With Jesus, the, the point is that he became a man, he conquered sin, so that we could then enter the throne room boldly, right? That word boldly means to speak your mind. And get this, never fear being too blunt. Isn't that interesting? Never fear being too blunt with God. Now, that obviously doesn't mean disrespectful and things like that. But you can just tell him what you're thinking. And you don't have to worry about him killing you or, you know, not listening to you or anything like that. You can go 
boldly, never fear being too blunt, and then the discover, so that you may discover the grace. Uh, I did tell you guys how it's uh, the word Eureka. So it's an intensely investigate study where all of a sudden, Eureka, you got the grace that you urgently need, and the word need is very interesting. It's a military operation to help a fallen comrade. That's what the word need means. Isn't that interesting? And then mercy's kiss to receive. You know, when I think of the word receive, I think of, you know, someone handing me something and I receive it. But have you ever had someone snatch a paper out of your hand? You know, something like that. That's what it means. It's not that you're receiving passively. In the Greek is you are forcibly seizing and laying hold of something and taking it as your own. So I wish it was more like grasp or, you know, seizing the grace. So to me, when you look in the original language, we see that this is not a passive, you know, you're a pitiful human being going before God, hoping to obtain some mercy to help you because you're struggling with the fact that the pastor didn't shake your hand when you came into church that morning. Instead, it's a military operation that you're in the middle of a battle, right? You're in the middle of a battle and you need some help. So you're going to march right into the war room, right into the throne room and say, I need this, this, and this in order to fulfill the mission you have given me to fulfill. And I now grasp it. I seize it. Eureka, I'm going to take it with me and win the fight. Totally different picture. Totally different picture. One thing that you have to remember is, number one, we're not widows. We're brides. And number two, we are brides with army boots on, always. We don't have no high heels walking around trying not to fall. We have army boots on, right? So that's the picture. So then Paul gives us that picture, which is totally different than most of what's uh, taught. And the only reason that we can come in that way is because Jesus Christ, our King, conquered sin. Therefore, he has made us king priests. So then Paul is continuing his thoughts, saying that the earthly high priest, I hope you notice, was chosen from among the people and appointed to represent them before God. Right? So, all other high priests were inferior to Jesus Christ because, number one, they were human, but he was too. So, what made them a little bit different? Well, they were chosen from among the people. He was appointed as God to become man and to always remain God. Right? And always now to remain man. So, they had to offer sacrifices on behalf of those they were appointed to, but also themselves since all high priests before Christ suffered from the same weakness. Now, weakness is, quote, a state of incapacity to do or experience something. Now, it's often used to refer to when you're weak physically, uh, maybe due to an illness or something of that nature, but it also was speaking of an internal reality due to the fall of mankind. In other words... The weakness that is being referred here is the incapacity to be free from sin. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about, you know, health and physical and all that, although that's included in the covenant and what he purchased for us. But no person before Christ could be incapable of sin's dominion. They cannot, un they cannot escape from that reality. Okay, so then that should bring up a point that in the majority of churches in the Western Hemisphere, I can't speak for the Eastern Hemisphere, but I dang sure can speak for America, most of the churches that I have been a part of actually preach more sin than the fact that you are free from it. In fact, if you were, and y'all have all heard me, but I think this is worthy of repeating because it's been a while, if you, you will hear a Christian say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. If you tell them they're not a sinner, they're like, what? It's like, have you not heard the good news? But most of what's taught in churches on the sin issue especially is bad news. 
So you get uh, instruction that you're fighting two <coughs> natures on the inside of you, but the Bible tells us that old nature that was prone to sin has been crucified. It is dead. Does it mean you can't be tempted? Absolutely not. But those that have grasped the reality that they are already righteous, they are not dominated by sin nor subjected to sin. Sin has no power over them. They consider or do the mathematical calculation that the price paid freed them from the effectiveness of sin. Those that live that way then try to communicate that to someone else, you're met with blank stares. Don't you think it's like um, when somebody loses a limb? You know, they said, You still feel like you have itch. a limb. Mm -hmm. uh, it will hurt, mm -hmm. even though you don't have a limb anymore, mm -hmm. that you still have all the symptoms. It's a from phantom. Being, and phantom. And mm -hmm. I think once that we have that old man crucified, we still have phantom sim symptoms or you know, mm -hmm. that we still think that is there, and it's not. Well, and the reason we think it's there is because it's very simple. There's a very simple reason. The soul must be renewed by the Word. So the sinful nature is dead. The soul has to be renewed. So people get confused. They're like, well, if sin had no power over me, then why did I do that? It's your thinking. That's what has to be yeah. transformed. And so... Here, and then let's take it a step further, because now when you go to the, the level that the Lord says we're supposed to be in, now you can almost be labeled a heretic if you're not careful. Because in 1 John, let me see if I can find it. I think it's chapter 1 into uh, chapter 2. You said 1 John? Yeah. Okay, so let's, and I don't have my, um, my other Bible, but let's actually start with uh, verse 5 in 1 John 1. It says, this is the life-giving message we heard him share, and it's still ringing in our ears. We now repeat his words to you. God is pure light. You will never find even a trace of darkness in Him. If we claim that we share life with Him, but keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves and not living the truth. But if we keep living in the pure light that surrounds Him, we share unbroken fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, continue, continually cleanses us from all sin. Now this is important. It's not saying that you're going to sin. It's a matter of location. Are you walking in the dark or are you walking in the light? If you're walking in the light, what does light naturally do? It exposes. So as you walk in the light, the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Truth, says, Hey, I don't like what you did or what you said or your thought process it's not congruent with my word okay and so you're like you're right that is not congruent i apologize for that and i thank you for revealing it to me and you continue on and guess what happens when you come into agreement with light that area is healed by light because light also heals like um uh eagles if they're sick, like if they get, because they like uh, meat that's fresh, right? But if they get a hold of any meat that's bad and they get sick, they find the highest place they can get to away from predators that has water. They then painstakingly pull all of their feathers out. Okay? Then they lay down on the rock, which is where spread eagle, eagle comes from. They lay down on the rock and they just... Let the sun pull out all the impurities. Then they get in the water and wash, and then they lay it out again. They're not getting a suntan. They're just allowing light to pull out the impurities. And then they have to remain up there until they have grown all new feathers. Isn't that interesting? So sometimes, you're, as you're walking, it may require a pause 
to go deeper into maybe something that's more embedded in your thinking, which is why it's so important to do that. You know, it's one thing, maybe you said a bad word or maybe you were rude to somebody, you know, and you're like, Lord, you're absolutely correct. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I agree with you. Would you like me to call that person? Is there anything I need to do? Versus a repetitive, ingrained behavior or thought process, right? In heaven, thoughts are louder than words. See, on earth, you can fool a bunch of people with words. In heaven, you can't. So your thoughts, he'll often target and want you to deal with. So sometimes you can just continue walking and the light does its job. Other times you need to find you some water or word. You need to get in the light and you need to spend a little bit of time for Holy Spirit to begin to reveal those things and don't hide under the cover of your excuses. Pull all those things out, no matter how painful. So the main point though is as you do this, he cleanses you from all sin. This is having faith in the blood of Jesus for forgiveness of sin versus you feeling that you have to earn his approval once again. Okay? So it's a continuous process. It's not that you have to stop and say, please forgive me. It's you agree, you move on, he cleanses. Verse 8. If we boast that we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and our strangers to the truth. But if we freely admit our sins when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ, and He will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we're not guilty of sin when God uncovers it with His light, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. So in other words, let Him deal with the stuff that He needs to deal with, but this is also referring to those who uh, need to be born again. Where you have people that say, well, I'm a good person. No, that has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do if you're a good person or not. It has to do, are you born again? Are you now a species of heaven? Are you now superhuman? Because that's what we are. We're <coughs> superhuman, extra human. So then he says, verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1, this is where people start to freak out. You are my dear, dear children. And I write these things to you so that you won't sin. But if, not when, like most people teach, if anyone does sin, we continually have a forgiving Redeemer who is face to face with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. Verse 2, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not our only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's saying, I'm writing the, the, you these words so that you won't sin. But if you do. Now, let's think about that for a second. What he's saying, the implication, is it is possible to not sin. Oh, my word. I remember one time I told someone that, and I thought I was going to be like crucified right there. Put on the stake. Start the fire. What do you mean? Are you saying that you're without sin? Well, no, but I'm saying that's my goal, right? Why would that be any different than being healed? Why would that be any different than being prosperous? If the cross is the answer to poverty, if the cross is the answer to sickness, then why is the cross not the answer to sin? Because positionally, I'm without it. So what is the problem? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think what's happened is just like people create doctrine that God doesn't heal all the time because someone didn't get healed, just like people create doctrine that you're supposed to be poor because that's godly, and just like people create doctrine that you will always sin and always fail, they're all based on experiences. One time I was talking to a pastor and I said, it's in the Word, it's the truth, that's what it says. Well, I knew a guy, but I'm like, it doesn't matter. I don't care what your guy did. I don't care what you saw. The Word says this. And God is looking for a people that will believe this above any experience that contradicts or is inferior of the reality here. Because the only way you're going to experience the full reality of the covenant benefits that He died to give us is by believing this over what you see and what you hear that contradicts it. Right? So that's that's the tension that we're called to. To live in. And so Jesus conquered sin, therefore we are not subject to it and we have the upper hand, right? So we're soldiers. 
Okay, so in uh, verse 4, it says, And no one takes this honor of being appointed upon himself by being self-appointed. But God is the one who calls each one, just as Aaron was called. So I've got some good news for you, uh, especially if you're in a church where you have to get uh, uh, three elder meetings and uh, a contract drawn up and uh, spies sent to your Bible studies in order to conduct one, that God calls you. The only job of the ecclesia is to confirm and to equip what you're called to do. So you have Peter, and they're like, hey, we don't have time to distribute all these funds to everybody. We're not called to serve tables. And it wasn't a demeaning term. It's just like we, we need to be devoted to the word prayer. So they, what did he say? Find people among yourselves that are of a good reputation, full of wisdom, and let's appoint them. So the people recognize a gifting in seven individuals and said these men would be great to do that job. And so they're like, okay, and they just appointed them. Whatever you're called to, whatever God appoints you to, you're already doing it by the time the commission comes, which I'll get into that uh, later in this instruction. So this idea that you have to have a church validate your call is based in a pharisaical mindset. That is one of the things I, you know, we've been praying for exposure and against Jezebel spirit. But I, got, I just felt like it, we should be praying against the pharisaical spirit as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You have where the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, who gave you the authority to do these things? Right? He wasn't ordained by them. He wasn't appointed by them. He was appointed by God himself. This is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. And then he went through his uh, period of being tempted, and then he came out in power, right? So it's very important to not look to man to appoint you, but instead to look to those who know you to confirm what you're already doing. Now, if you're doing stuff that's silly, and you're getting, you know, mess is created and you're being rebellious and things like that absolutely that's where the fivefold comes in shuts it down um, if necessary but it's nowhere in scripture that you have to be appointed by a man to serve in the kingdom of god nowhere now people may say well what about acts 13 where the they laid hands the elders laid hands on paul and barnabas what were they doing the laying on of hands, if you look at the context, is they were praying for them because they were already operating in that function. Because it says previous to that there were certain prophets and teachers of whom Saul and Barnabas, Holy Spirit said, right? Separate unto me. Holy Spirit said separate unto me Barnabas and Saul that I may send them out. So then the elders are like, yes, sir. So they come around them after fasting and prayer, lay their hands on them to impart some spiritual gift they might need, and then they send them out. So it just is the, the kind of like with the prophetic training, a lot of reasoning was exposed. If you look at a lot of the crap that churches do, a lot of it is man. And if you get down to the Let's just get down to the meat and potatoes, the heart of the issue. It's a fear of losing control. It may be painted as uh, wanting to protect the sheep. It can be painted as, well, that problem used to do this, so we bet, you know, or that person used to do this, that might be a problem, so we better, you know, whatever it is. I don't know who appointed pastors or fivefold ministers, for that matter, to be the Holy Spirit police. And to serve as judge, jury, and executioner. The purpose of the fivefold is to equip and to correct any mistakes that need to be fixed. That's it. Before we go on, I just thought it was interesting because the Passion just has a footnote. And it says, keeping God's commandments is the proof and evidence of coming to know God, mm -hmm. not a means of knowing God. Oh, that's good. Can you read that again? Yes. Keeping God's commandments is the proof and evidence of coming to know God, 
not the means of knowing God. And I think That's that good. a lot of people think that they are keeping that so that they can get close to God. Mm -hmm. That they can start to know keep God. Keep the rules and regulations. Keep the rules and the regulations. Mm -hmm. But it's saying, you know, that's our evidence because we want to do what's pleasing to God. Yeah. But it doesn't help us to know Him. Oh, no. If that was the case, the Pharisees wouldn't have uh, right. uh, helped execute His crucifixion. And then on top of that, Jesus said, if you love me, you do what I say. Not you do what I say and you love me. The love for Him is, the evidence is the obedience. Mm -hmm. Right? So, on the other side of not needing congressional action for you to minister in the church, the other side of that is there are some self-appointed people. They have not been appointed by God. Titles are important, influence and power, uh, having a voice is important. So there are those, and we're going to get to those in a, a little bit. So I, I don't want to, you know, say anyone that's out there, oops, Anyone that's out there is supposed to be out there. I've met a lot of pastors that should not be pastors, let me tell you. Uh, I've met a lot of uh, apostles that say they were apostles, that they're no more apostle than my cat. So there's definitely people that are out there doing stuff that they are not. I don't know. Joseph is kind of annoying. You know, he is annoying. <laughs> yes. So this is the paradox. You know, you don't want just anyone going around saying they're an apostle and prophet, and they're not. But the other side of that is that without the professional clergy's approval, you will be viewed with suspicion or as a rebellious person. Or you'll be viewed as a Jezebel. Just because you're a female and you speak what is on your mind in the context of Holy Spirit or whatever it is. Me and Mike encountered so much misunderstanding of even our relationship and the dynamics there. You know, it's like, Mike's the quiet one. Well, he should be the one talking. He doesn't want to talk. <laughs> You know? So leave them alone. I mean, it was frustrating. And then I'm the one, guess what? I like to talk. So it's a natural, It's it, that's just how it is. But I can guarantee you, anytime Mike says something, I listen. He's like E.F. Hutton. Because he doesn't say anything unless he has a reason. And he dang sure is not wrapped around my little pinky. So, but we would have people that they'd be like, man, it must be a trip living with her. I mean, Gigi might be able to say that. I think Mike is just obviously blessed with a gift from heaven. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, just even ha it's what it is, is people is they are imposing upon you their idea of who no. you are. And that should never be the case. And here's the other thing. What idea towards yourself are you imposing? Mm -hmm. Like you said, you would have never prophesied that. That's why Jehovah, he's Jehovah Sneaky too. Yeah. And yeah. Darina almost blew it. So I think <laughs> Darina probably needs to keep those thoughts to herself. When she's like, hey, is this like in the lesson where they were prophesying to themselves? I'm like, I'm not going to tell you that. Anyway, she's too prophetic. Yeah, so there you go. what ideas are you imposing upon yourself? Look at your spiritual intelligence report. Which parts are challenging you? Mm -hmm. Whatever part's challenging you, that's where you really need to come into that agreement. Of course, Gigi doesn't have one because he didn't obey instructions. <laughs> I had to give it to the person he got it for. That was so funny when he was like telling me, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that's John. I saw Gigi. <laughs> but anyway, so in Mark 11, I want to go over here. Uh, to verses 27 through 28. Mark 11, 27 through 28. Okay. So it says in verse 27, They came again into Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the Jewish rulers, the chief priests, certain religious scholars, and the elders approached him. Uh, they came to him and asked, What right do you have to say and do these things? Who gave you the authority to do all of this? Now, what he was doing is he drove out the merchants. Remember, he sat in a corner and methodically made a whip and then ran them out. And they're like, okay, and I would be the same way. If some dude comes in 
and he starts, you know, driving people out with a whip, I'd probably be like, okay, wow, where, what's going on here? Where did you come from? By what authority are you doing these things? So it's actually a legitimate question to ask, but uh, he had already by this point had several miracles under his belt, several encounters, and they just refused to believe. So um, one thing that I want to say regarding their question is Jesus was not one of the professional clergymen. He wasn't one of them. He wasn't part of the clique. So what I like is he then pointed to another who wasn't one of them and turned the question to their own detriment because he said, I too have a question to ask you. If you can answer this question, then I'll tell you by what power I do all these things. Where did John's authority to immerse come from? Was it from heaven or was it from the people? Answer me now. Man, he's like all up in their business. So then it says they stepped away and they debated. And they're like, well, how should we answer this? If we say, I mean, I could just like picture Pelosi there and Schumer, you know, and all that stuff. Um, if we say from heaven, he's going to say to us, then why didn't you respond to John and believe what he said? But if we say from the people, we fear the crowds for they're convinced that John was God's prophet. So here's the thing. You can actually use the fear that religious people have and political people have and turn it on them. And so Jesus, uh, so they finally said, well, we don't know. And so Jesus like, well, I'm not going to tell you where my power comes from to do these things. I love that. They said, wait, <laughs> <laughs> so, again, there are people, what I'm doing is I'm presenting you a picture of discernment. You know, if some crazy person carrying a cross um, comes in and starts pulling out a whip, I might have to pull out my Hellcat. You know what I mean? Not necessarily shoot them, but at least neutralize the threat. Um... You know, that's, but on the other side of that is you may have people that are legitimate prophets, apostles, that they may rub you the wrong way. Is that a test of your heart to see if you're willing to receive from someone that they are in that position, but you don't recognize them necessarily? So it definitely is going to take discernment. So you have those who claim that they are certain things and they're not, and then you have those that more than likely don't claim they're certain things and they are. You know, that's the thing. A lot of the people that are in that office, they don't walk around saying what they are. In fact, the only time you see them saying what they are is when they need to um, emphasize their authority to be there to do, to inspire faith in the other. See, because if you receive a righteous man, you get a righteous man's reward. If you view that righteous man as a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. You see what I mean? So however you view that person, which is why, guys, and this is very important, the sin of being too familiar can cause you to stumble. So when you're part of an ecclesia, not a church situation, but when you're part of an ecclesia, we all do life together, right? It would cause me to stumble if I don't recognize who Diane is to us. If I don't recognize her giftings. Like I pulled out y'all's paper.